evening. And hello again. I'm Jeffrey Brown. And now I am joined by Ron Rash, novelist and short story writer. And we're going to talk about new collection, Something Rich and Strange. Welcome to you. Good to be here. Th these, uh, these, these books explore a life of a uh, part of the country that perhaps doesn't get as much attention in our literary culture. Is that how it feels? Sometimes yeah. it, it does, and I think sometimes when it does get attention, it's in, in the most stereotypical way. And, I, and one hope that I have as a writer is that uh, I ex at least delve into the complexity of the region and perhaps uh, allow my readers to sense some of that complexity. Well, tell us about the complexity. You, this is part. This is your life, right? I mean, this is your, these are this is your area. Uh, it is. This yeah. My family has very deep roots yeah. in uh, the North Carolina mountains, and and it's. Uh, like any place full of contrast, you have a very sophisticated city such as Asheville, but then 20 miles away you're in wilderness, the Smoky Mountains Park. And so I'm, I'm very interested in the way uh, those interact at times and also just a sense of how landscape affects psychology. What, and, and how does it affect it in, in that part of the region? Well, I'm, I'm convinced that how... I feel like I know it a little bit, oh, you yeah. know, but as one of these people that come occasionally and pass mm -hmm. through and... Well, it's a place that sometimes can have very uh, positive aspects as far as the landscape, a sense of almost womb-like enclosure, protectiveness. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the mountains can feel very oppressive, and yeah. particularly if you're living in a dark cove, the lack of light, and I think sometimes there can be almost a fatalism at times. And, and also, from what I have seen, a kind of, um, and it comes out in your stories too, the, the sort of mix of traditions and people in the you know contemporary outside world right, as well, right? Right, right, yeah. How, yeah. do, how, do, how does that interplay take place? Uh, just a conflict of cultures at times, mm -hmm. uh, and people who, in a sense, very often are bewildered by the, the world that they found themselves in, uh, particularly, for instance, uh, the way uh, meth can be a problem in that region, and then people struggling with that mm -hmm. uh, in generations past would not have. So, so where do your stories come from? Uh, how, how, do they, how do they start? I think they start with landscape, and yeah. they start uh, out of the landscape. I think they kind of come out of that. Uh, maybe because I, I write poetry as well, they begin with images and uh, literally. I mean, yeah, you're literally. jotting down something you see, and or or just comes to me sometimes. Yeah. It just yeah. uh, for some yeah. reason comes, and I'll I'll follow that image, see what happens. <laughs> really? Yeah. So the image, the landscape, and then somehow it becomes people. Right, right, <laughs> and and that's when. Locking in on the voice is probably the third component of that, and then yeah. I, I feel like I'll let the story, uh, you hope, or I hope, tell itself. Uh huh. Now you you you've written a number, many novels, mm -hmm. and then th this is I gather a collection. This is from two collections, right? Pulled together. Well, actually, uh, four and a few new stories. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of my life's work uh, so far in a short story. Yeah. And so so when you pull it together and 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 look back, I'm curious about what you see, how you've developed particularly as a short story writer. Right. I, I see uh, certain influences perhaps dropping away, early influences. Who uh, are the early influences? Well, writers such as Flannery O'Connor, yeah. certainly, and a uh, little bit of Faulkner, maybe. And uh, the, the style becoming tighter, more concise, kind of going away from that really uh, high rhetoric of, yeah. of a Faulkner or MacArthur. Yeah. But those are the people you read. Is, it, is that how you developed uh, your love of reading and well, writing? Yeah, and, and also the Russians. Uh, Dostoevsky has been as important to me as any writer. Really? Because? Uh, his sensibility, uh, his ambitiousness, uh, his willingness to tackle incredibly complex questions and to uh, reveal them in complex ways. So uh, I'm sure young, younger writers would be interested. How do you, how do you finally drop them? You know, uh, and find yeah. your own voice. Well, you just kind of write them out of your system. I think it's yeah. you know, it's like uh, I think any art form. Uh, you know, a guitarist probably starts Im Im off imitating uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, yeah. or Eric Clapton, and yeah. then slowly he or she develops. Uh, yeah. Don't, don't and, and do you have different theories of what becomes a novel and what stays as a short story? Or? Well, every time I, I, I start a, what I, what is a story, I. I I, I hope it's not going to be a novel because I hate writing novels. I, <laughs> it, it's horrible. I, I vow I'll never write it. Because it's just too hard? Yeah, it's three years, and, and, <laughs> and I can't get it out of my head. I never can relax for uh -huh. three years. But short stories are my favorite form, uh -huh. I, and I think they're the hardest to do well. All right, I want to I ask you to read a little bit All so right. we can get the people can hear that All voice. Right. That, All right. Okay. Yeah, this is a story about a, a, a woman who's lived in isolation almost all of her life, but she still needs to connect to people, mm -hmm. and she does it anonymously. Uh, at a radio station late night. Jenny slept as the sky cleared to a high bright blue. By noon the temperature was in the 40s. 
When her alarm clock went off at three, she lay in bed a few minutes, listening to cars slosh through melting snow. She would not read a, need a ride into work. She would drive herself across town, looking through safety glass as she passed the school where she had taught, then the hospital where her face had been stitched back together. At the radio station, she would unlock the door, and soon enough, Buddy Harper would end his broadcast and leave. She would say, this is the Nighthawk, and play after midnight. Jenny would speak to people in bedrooms, to clerks drenched in the fluorescent light of convenience stores, to mill workers driving back roads home after graveyard shifts. She would speak to the drunk and sober, the godly and the godless, all the while high above where she sat, the station's red beacon would pulse like a heart, as if giving bearings to all those in the dark, adrift and alone. You know, we, we, we start, you, you, you start by saying that people come to this area or think about it in a stereotypical way. I suppose that's also true about the writing of, of, of the South and of Appalachia. Right. Does it, is it still put in a genre that way, you know? Is it that? Well, it, it can be, and I, I think one, one thing I find uh, hilarious is the idea that uh, a writer say writing about New York City is not considered regional. Yeah, you know, I yeah. mean, Richard Price is a writer I love, but but I think his strength is that he uh, gets captures the universal through the particular, yeah. through that particular place. And yeah. I think that's what any writer who's any good, uh, even though you're writing about one region, you're ultimately writing about all places because you're writing about what it means to be a human being. Yeah, but but we're at a time in the culture where it seems you know people feel have a, almost a nostalgic sense for regionalism because of so much of it's lost. Yeah, yeah. You're in a part where right. there still is a sort of separate regionalism. Right. But you're saying that can be a, a kind of negative or a kind of well, no, know, not, put down is the right no, thing. No, I, I think the, the, the best writing uh, can be both yeah. simultaneously. I mean, it's almost like a farmer drilling for water. Uh, if, if he goes deep enough into that place, mm -hmm. uh, that particular place, uh, uh, he or she is going to hit the uh, universal. Yeah, that's what you're yeah. striving for. Yeah, yeah. well, your door well, he says, one place understood helps us understand all other places better. Yeah. I believe that. What about the, the short story? I'm just wondering if, um, if we're having a sort of short story moment, you know, uh, uh, where people weren't writing them perhaps so much, or at least they weren't getting as much attention. And then you had Alice Munro with a Nobel, yeah. and you, see, you see, just see more, more interest, I guess. Yeah, it's been amazing, just the last two or three years. And I, it's, I think it's America's greatest contribution to literature. Really? Well, literature is the short story. Really? Oh, because? Yeah. Uh, it's what we've done best in our influence. I mean, you begin with Poe, Hemingway, uh, O'Connor, yeah. uh, you know, continuing into the present. And I, I, it, I find it the most difficult form. I, really? You know, I write poetry and novels as well. But when it's done well, you have this amazing thing where the writer's able to give a sense of who the character has been and who that character will ever be in, in just this one crystallized few pages. Uh, Alice Monroe does that, William Trevor does that, uh, uh, certainly James Joyce, Chekhov, and that, that's the glory of the short story. All right, well, that's great. So th th this collection is Something Rich and Strange. Ron Rash, thanks so much. Thank you.